Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Mondays with Mundy, and that's me, Jim Mundy, the historian for the Union League Legacy Foundation. And if you're not familiar with the surroundings, we are in the Union League's archival collection vault in the Heritage Center on the ground floor of the Broad Street building. We've only been in here once before, so we thought it was about time to come back, especially as we kick off the new year. So this is our first episode for 2022 that airs on January the 10th. Uh, we have great things in the collection vault, as we've seen before. But one of the things we never talked about is our Civil War swords. And we have some wonderful swords, uh, two of them recently acquired. And I thought that we would learn about them. So uh, three swords, three stories, all with a Union League connection, which, is, which really makes them neat. So we're going to start with the sword of Christopher Stewart Patterson. And for those of you who saw the episode a few weeks ago that we did on art and portraiture in the League House, I focused on C. Stuart Patterson's portrait in Founders, all right? So C. Stuart Patterson, as we know, was from Philadelphia, University of Pennsylvania graduate, 1865, lawyer, uh, and uh, joined the Union League, 1895, and then uh, actually, actually 1890, and then would be the club president in 1897 and 1898, so. But Civil War, all right? Uh, he joined uh, the 52nd Pennsylvania Emergency Militia, and the 52nd was also known as the 3rd Union League Regiment. So he very early became involved with the Union League uh, through the Civil War. Now, it was a 90-day regiment. They weren't expected to do much, and they didn't, to be honest. But as the story goes, they found themselves in Carlisle, Pennsylvania on July the 1st of 1863. So pop quiz, what else is going on on July the 1st of 1863, 30 miles south, Gettysburg? Okay, so the Battle of Gettysburg has already begun. Now, Carlisle had a military barracks in it from the 1750s, uh, which also included a cavalry uh, barracks for training cavalry officers and soldiers. So it had a long military connection to begin with. The Confederate Army had already entered Pennsylvania uh, in late June of 1863, as they were all moving their way towards they thought would be either Harrisburg or Philadelphia. Instead, they would end up in Gettysburg. So the second corps of the Army of Northern Virginia was commanded by Dick Ewell. And they entered from the west side of Gettysburg. They went around Gettysburg to the north to Carlisle, where they were scavenging for supplies and food and money and things like that. Now, Ewell received orders to report to Gettysburg. So they pack up and they leave. And after they left, Gettysburg, I'm sorry, Carlisle was then occupied by militia units from both New York and Pennsylvania, including Landis's first battery from the Philadelphia Light Artillery. And, and it was Patterson as a colonel in the Light Battery that got him to Carlisle on July the 1st of 1863 when the Confederate cavalry commanded by the infamous General Jeb Stuart uh, threatened to basically attack the city, uh, bombard the city, and I suggested that the Union Army uh, give up, which they did not do. And so Stuart, late in the afternoon to early evening, uh, the Confederates began a bombardment of the city itself. And it was there that Patterson was wounded in the battle. And we have his sword from the battle. So let's take a look at it, shall we? So, doesn't look like much, does it? Keep in mind, this was a militia unit. Uh, these soldiers are not expected uh, again, it's a 90-day unit, so they're not going to need the best equipment because they're not really expected to do much in terms of fighting. So here we have a very simple and somewhat rusty blade from Patterson's sword. There is little, there's no iconography on it. Uh, it is as plain and simple a sword blade as you are going to find. What makes it interesting, though, is the scabbard. So let me show you the scabbard instead. And that's what we have here. So as you can see from the scabbard, it took a hit. Actually, Patterson took a hit. Patterson was wounded in the engagement. So a bullet obviously hit the scabbard and then would ricochet into Patterson himself. Now, Patterson obviously survived, as we know from his future here at the League itself. So it, it's interesting that, um, now Patterson kept his sword and it was donated to the Union League in 1937 by Patterson's son, George Stewart Patterson. And he and his father were the only father-son presidential combination in the Union League's history. So, so we have the sword, obviously, you saw the blade without the guard and the grip, right? Because that was lost. And, but we have the sword and the scabbard. So interesting story there and a nice way to start off. So the next blade, uh, we'll do this chronologically, is the newest acquisition in the collection. 
and it involves a Union League, re actually a Union League regiment. Um, actually two Union League regiments, believe it or not. So the hero of our story in this case is John Digman, D-I-G-M-A-N. And uh, John was born in 1813 in Baltimore, but came to Philadelphia in 1850. And there is an unofficial record that he joined a Union League regiment, uh, I'm sorry, a Union regiment in 1861, but we cannot find his name in any official regimental roster. So he first officially appears on the roster of the 52nd Pennsylvania Militia, Emergency Militia Unit, which was a 90-day unit called up right at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg. And it was the third militia, emergency militia unit called up through the Union League's military committee. Uh, this is, so this is a sword actually um, that was given to Digman when he joined the 183rd Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry Regiment. Now, the 52nd was mustered out in September of 1863, the fall of 1863, and shortly after that, the 183rd, known as the 4th Union League Regiment, began to muster in at the end of December, January and February, early March of 1864. And uh, they were assigned to the Army of the Potomac, which was the largest fighting unit within the Union Army itself. Now, in March of 1864, U.S. Grant had been made commander of all Union armies, commander-in-chief, and Grant, not being a general to sit at a desk, but rather, you know, someone who wouldn't let a lot of grass grow under his feet, Grant immediately moved his headquarters into the field with the Army of the Potomac itself. And Grant's overall plan was something called the Overland Campaign, and the idea was to simply attack, attack, and attack the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia, commanded by Robert E. Lee in Virginia, and basically beat them into submission and then surrender. So the 183rd was involved in this campaign through the rest, because this campaign lasted for the rest of the war itself. So, so the 183rd was engaged in fighting uh, at a place called uh, Spotsylvania Courthouse, which is oh, just a few miles to the southwest of Fredericksburg, Virginia. And if you look at a map, Fredericksburg is north of Richmond. All right, and so we're looking at the Poe River region where there was some engagement. And on May the 10th, uh, John, Captain John Digman took a bullet right in the chest, uh, which normally would have been fairly fatal. But Digman uh, must have been made of much sterner stuff. And keep in mind, he's at this point 49 years old. So tough old guy, right? And he survives. He recovers from his wounds at the General Hospital at the Naval Academy in Annapolis, joins, rejoins the regiment on July the 8th of 1864. And it is at this time in all probability that his non-commissioned officers and soldiers in Company H, the 183rd, present him with something called a presentation sword. So what we have here is the scabbard to that presentation sword. So let me get my glasses on so I can read this to you. All right. Okay. Now, obviously, this is, you can just tell by the decoration itself that this sword was not meant to be used in the field. Uh, I mean, it's just obviously too good. You, I mean, you've seen Patterson swords already. You get an idea of how plain and simple a Civil War sword could be. But nonetheless, we have some wonderful imagery, these cartouches, if you will, on the blade itself. Columbia with her shield. We have Militaria. Obviously, it says U.S. Muskets, drum, shields, flags, things like that. And then down here, we have some more Militaria images. But here we have a shield and helmet something a little more medieval, but nonetheless. And then here towards the top, we actually have the presentation plate on it. So let me read it for you. It says, presented to Captain John Digman by the non-commissioned officers and privates of Company H, 183rd PV, or Pennsylvania Volunteers. So beautiful scabbard. And wait until you see the sword. So here we have the sword itself, and what a spectacular piece of craftsmanship it is. And again, this is not meant to be used in battle. This is meant to be a museum piece in a way. And I hope that Joe can, can get in on that. Just wonderful carving. And towards my left thumb, it says G.W. Simmon and Brother, Philadelphia, PA. So they were the military manufacturer who put the whole sword and scabbard together. Wonderful etching on the blade. Again, Militaria insignia. Then it says here, for union and liberty. And then more engravings going down the blade itself. 
And then if we flip the blade over, we have even more. E pluribus unum. And then we have the American Eagle, which again says E pluribus unum on it, and more military insignia. But then up again, underneath the hilt, we have engraving that says W. Klauberg Zollingen. And I don't know if any of you know much about Zollingen, but Zollingen is in the Ruhr River Valley region of Western Germany, known as the Ruhr Argebiet, because it would become the industrial heart of Germany uh, uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries. Zollingen in the Middle Ages was also the center of armor manufacturing. So if you ever go to the Philadelphia Museum of Art and visit the Otto von Kainbusch collection, much of what you see there is, is, was made in Zollingen itself. So, and, and also, by the way, just a little bit of family history. My oldest granddaughter was born in Zollingen, Germany in the year 2000. So you never know, small world, right? So uh, we have the, the grip is made of polished ivory, which was unusual. It isn't exactly the most durable material for military use, but it's beautiful nonetheless. The guard, if you can see this, has an American eagle fighting a serpent, okay, over here. So obviously that it, the eagle represents the Union and the serpent is the Confederacy. All right, and then we have this wonderful sword knot gilded as well as everything else. And this is just a spectacular piece of, of, a, of, of military craftsmanship from the Civil War period. So John Digman, to continue the story, uh, again, returned to the regiment on July the 8th of 1864. And the battle continued, actually the, the whole overland campaign continues. And uh, he was eventually captured uh, on December 20, no, in the fall, uh, as the 183rd was in the area just south of New Market Heights, which you may remember was the battle on September 29th that involved the 6th United States Color Troop Regiment raised by the Union League. He was originally sent to Libya Prison, which is where Union officers were sent. Uh, re, you know, enlisted men went down to Andersonville in Georgia. Uh, he was transferred from Libby to Danville Prison, which is on the very southern border of Virginia along the North Carolina border as well. And it was there at Danville Prison that he would eventually die on December the 21st of 1864. Now, the sword was already in the family's possession, and it, and it stayed in the family until 1984 through Digman's wife's family. And in 84, it uh, went into the possession of a gentleman in Texas who was a, a military collector. And he then sold it uh, a number of years later to a sword collector in Pennsylvania who then put it up for auction uh, just about maybe, so oh, by now two months ago perhaps. And at that auction, Union League member Leo Holt purchased this sword and scabbard and other pieces from Digman, including his, captain, his captain's commission from May of 1863, a little carte de visite, a photograph of Digman in his military uniform, and his red officer sash as well, because the sash went around his waist, then the belt around that, and the sword hung off the belt. So we now have that complete collection thanks to the incredible generosity of Leo Holt. So Leo, thank you very, very much uh, for being such a great uh, benefactor to the League and to the Union League Legacy Foundation. So, right, sword number two. So sword number three. Um, let's get going. All right, it is. Now the story itself takes place in May of 1865, which is interesting because the war, actually the war didn't officially end until August of 66, but Lee had surrendered to Grant already on April the 9th of 1865 at Bad Maddox Courthouse. So effectively the war is over. And everybody in Texas apparently knew it, but doesn't mean they still didn't keep on fighting. Uh, in early 1865, the commanders of both the Union and Confederate armies realized that, you know, at this point, any further military action would just, was just useless bloodshed. And so they had an unofficial agreement that they would not fight each other. But uh, the Confederate, the overall Confederate commander in Texas uh, didn't want that to happen. And so they kept fighting. And to that extent then, uh, on May 12th and 13th of 1865, the Battle of Palmito Ranch took place. Now, Palmito Ranch, and that's what exists. It is a ranch. It's on the north bank of the Rio Grande River uh, between Los Barrazos de Santiago, which is the actual port on the Gulf of Mexico where the Rio Grande River flows into the Gulf, 
and Brownsville, Texas, about three miles further to the west, going a little upriver, if you will. Uh, the Union Army soldiers were commanded overall by Colonel Theodore Barrett. Uh, Barrett had been an, a, a Union officer since 1862, but had never had command or really significant command or had seen military action uh, in all that time. So here he is, you know, with an opportunity to finally get into the, the fight, if you will. The lieutenant colonel of the regiment was David Branson. So he's second in command. And Branson suggested that the command, that the soldiers, which at this point primarily uh, came from the 62nd United States Colored Infantry Regiment uh, with some soldiers from the 2nd Texas Cavalry dismounted and then eventually the 34th Indiana would engage in the battle itself against the Confederate soldiers. There were approximately 500 Union soldiers, 300 Confederate soldiers. Branson attacked the Confederate camp early in the day on the 12th. Uh, they disbanded the Confederate soldiers. Uh, the, Union arm, the Union soldiers are now in camp refreshing themselves and their horses. When the Confederates reattack them, they skirmish for the rest of the afternoon. Overnight, go into camp. Barrett arrives the next day and the fighting commences again for a second time. And at this point, uh, the Union soldiers are pretty well routed. But on the afternoon of May the 13th, as the fighting was winding down, Lieutenant Colonel David Branson stood up with his sword and yelled, cease firing. And with that, he ended the last battle of the Civil War. So let's take a look at that sword. All right, so here we have it. It's a very simple 18, 1840 style cavalry or dragoon saber. All right, very plain and simple as you can see. Nothing spectacular about it, uh, especially when you compare it to the scabbard that we saw of the Digman sword. I will pour the sword out a little bit. There is just a very simple cartouche that shows the Union, you know, the Union Eagle. And on the other side, it simply says, U.S., but again, nothing nearly as elaborate as what we saw on the previous sword. I will put that back together. All right. You can see the, the, the guard is open, the knuckle guard, if you will, and the grip itself is made of shark skin, not that wonderful ivory that we just saw a little while ago. But this is far more practical, to be honest, because this was meant to be an officer's sword that, went, that, that was used in battle if necessary. So let me read to you the inscription on this sword because this is really neat. So, Lieutenant Colonel David Branson, commanding 62nd Regiment, USCI, United States Colored Infantry, near mouth of Rio Grande, Texas, at sunset, May 13th, 1865, with this sword commanded, quote, cease firing, end of quote, at the close of the last battle of the War of the Rebellion. So, what is it doing here? How did we get the sword? So it's a pretty neat sword. So, oh my gosh, 20 years ago at least, uh, the Civil Roundtable uh, began a, a tradition of having a Civil War dress ball uh, around the time of Lincoln's birthday. And we encouraged all the attendees to come in period attire, whether civilian or military. And one of the early attendees for the first five, six, maybe seven years was Union League member Thatcher Longstreth. And some of you older members, um, as old as me at least, uh, remember that Thatcher Longstreth ran for mayor of Philadelphia back in the 1950s, early 60s, but never won an election because at this point Philadelphia had already become a democratic city. But Longstreth was certainly Mr. Philadelphia in all this time and a league member. And uh, so Thatcher would come to these dress balls in a rented Union general's outfit, which you know, wasn't as good as some of the military reenactors, as you can imagine, but he always had the sword on the sword belt at his side. And, you know, at that point, we didn't know anything about it. So Thatcher would die. Uh, the sword would kind of float in and out of the family for a few years. And then th uh, the League, the, back then, the Abraham Lincoln Foundation of the League was offered the opportunity of acquiring the sword. So through uh, the, the good graces of Thatcher Longstreth's son, Peter, who was a member of the League as well, and 
through Peter, the Longstreth Family Foundation, the Abraham Lincoln Foundation slash Legacy Foundation, was able to acquire the sword for the League's collection. And that all happened in 2014. So, so, I mean, how lucky can we get to have such magnificent swords? And we still have more left in the collection itself. So, um, so uh, next time you look you know, at a Civil War movie or a documentary or think of the, the Ken Burns Civil War series, uh, think about these swords that are now part of the Union League's collection. And if you're a Union League member, this is part of your collection because this collection is yours. This is your history. This is your patrimony. So, so I hope you've enjoyed this uh, little trip down through Civil War militaria that we had uh, to open our programming for 2022. Well, I hope everybody had a good holiday season, a relaxing, enjoyable new year, and I hope we all have a much happier and healthier 2022. So, so thank you for joining us as always. We greatly appreciate it. So stay well and see you next time. Thank you.